There's been a lot of buzz in the media recently about 3D printing. Uh, not all of it good, but most of it good. I, talking about the possibilities is uh, this idea that maybe someday if a piece of your microwave oven breaks, you don't have to send it away. You could just make some new little part in your bedroom and then install it yourself. Or if the heel off your shoe breaks, you could just print out a new heel to your shoe and glue it on and, and you're good to go. Um, so let's go ahead and talk uh, just a tiny, tiny bit about this idea of 3D printing. Um, that you can have these these devices, and let me see if I can I can pull this. How do I even do this? If I can pull this up on uh, may or may not be possible. So you can watch a 3D printer in action. <clears throat> okay, sorry about that. Okay, sorry, I didn't know about that. Okay, the sound is inconsequential. Uh, the main idea here is that, gee, look at that. You can print uh, not pieces of paper like I write my lectures on, but actual 3D objects. And as long as you can imagine each plane of this object as being what you draw on a sheet of paper, uh, you're perfectly capable of printing out complex machine parts, anything you need. Why go to the store anymore to buy things? You can just download the instructions instead and print things for yourself. And it's amazing the complex objects that you can make. This is coming to healthcare, to a business near you. In fact, it's already there. They print out 3D models of teeth, of skulls, um, little pieces that you can put in the ear or implant in the human body. Um, uh, now, th those types of three-dimensional printers or anything this cool, of course, has to involve organic chemistry. And so let's come back to that, of course. Okay, so what is this 3D printing business here? I'm going to show you the lowest tech possible. There are many varieties of ways to deposit three-dimensional materials, uh, and they are not all organic. You can also do this with metals, amazingly. I'm going to show you the cheapest version. They're just now dipping below $1,000 to, to buy and have your own three-dimensional printer. Uh, the fanciest ones actually create new molecules at the, at the site of the printhead. They have little... Uh, uh, little lasers that point down and create new molecules doing photochemistry. But the lowest tech models, the kind that you're likely to buy first uh, in the near future, actually use these spools of plastic. And all they do is feed these little plastic lines. You can now have different color 3D printers to print amazing objects. Uh, they feed these little spools of plastic thread and then right there at the printhead they melt them and then deposit them on a three-dimensional surface. And sometimes they have an extra line with filler in there in case there's overhangs so that you can print easily. This filler can be easily washed away when you're done so that you leave gaps where that filler used to be. So there's two common plastics that are used in those cheap fillers for the cheap style 3D printers that you're likely to end up with in your home. Uh, and this is one of them, polylactic acid. Um, and I think the other one is based on an acrylic acid resin. We, we're not going to talk about that. And this is polylactic acid. It's a very sim based on a very simple monomer, lactic acid. It's something that you have in the human body. And it's also a molecule that's considered a biopolymer that you can get from bacteria on a renewable basis. So <clears throat> we haven't talked at all about polymer chemistry, but it's this repeating unit very similar to, to the amino acid uh, alanine. So if you replace that with an NH, this would be basically a polymer of alanine. But naturally occurring polymer uh, that you can find in nature, it's a, a, pol uh, it's a polymer that t lends itself very well to this process of melting and depositing. So I I'm, I'm guessing in a few years some of you guys are going to have these things in your, in your home, in your bedroom or office, printing out objects, maybe printing out uh, medical devices or not out of this material. So take, your, take what you learn in this class and go design some new classes of, of, of biocompatible plastics so that you can print out new parts for my human body as it degrades over the next 10 years. Um, so I need you to work on that. Okay, let's return back 
to, uh, to NMR. Uh, I made a point that the sapling homework, right, we're not finishing the, the NMR section chapter 14 until today, so I'm extending the, the sapling homework for chapter 14 until Wednesday, uh, until Wednesday evening. Uh, we're covering probably today the most, most complex part of NMR spectroscopy, and it's called splitting. So I mentioned, yes? Sure. Sorry, th I'm, somebody asked to turn the volume up. I'll. Yeah. Okay, am I, uh, maybe I could just talk louder. <laughs> so, I'm always running the, I'm right on the edge here of feedback, so I think that's good. Okay, so um, we're, we're on the last part of spectroscopy, and I mentioned that there are three different things that affect the frequency at which protons resonate in the proton NMR spectrum. And the single biggest effect that you will see in, in a proton NMR spectrum that shifts things is magnetic anisotropy. Protons that are directly attached to carbons that are part of CC double bonds and benzene rings. Remember this circulating current that gets generated in a benzene ring creates this tiny little magnetic field and the closer I am to a CC pi bond or a benzene ring, the more I'm going to be shifted down field to seven to eight parts per million. So magnetic anisotropy is the biggest effect in proton NMR. The second biggest effect in proton NMR is being next to electronegative atoms. That's this de-shielding effect. If I'm next to some chlorine or fluorine or oxygen, it will suck electrons from away from me so I can see more of the magnetic field. So that's the second biggest effect. And then the last effect we're going to talk about today, and that is the effect of nearby protons. Every little proton is a tiny magnet. And because every little proton is a tiny magnet, I'll be able to see those protons uh, that are nearby me because they either lead to a bigger magnetic field or a smaller one. Okay, so let's, let's take an example of, of this effect. I feel like I'm hearing some noise, so let, let me turn that down. Okay, so proton neighbors couple. <clears throat> so let's go ahead and think about this bold proton here. And let me, maybe I can try to circle it with a different pen color or just underline it so we can see where our attention should be focused. This is going to create huge problems for you that you're always going to, it can very easily get confusing about which protons we're trying to focus on. So let's focus on this boxed bold proton there. And consider the effects of the neighboring proton. We're interested in the, re the resonance frequency of the boxed proton there. And it's got a neighbor. Here's this neighbor. And what I'm showing you is that this proton has two quantized choices. It's either spin up or spin down. About 50% of the molecules are spin up and about 50% of the molecules are spin down. There's a slight population difference. If I take 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules, on average, 50% of that mole of protons or molecules will have this proton with spin up and the other 50% of, of, the, uh, of those molecules will have this proton with spin down. So in other words, this proton, for half of the molecules, this proton will feel a slightly bigger magnetic field. And then for molecules like this, this proton will feel a slightly smaller magnetic field because this magnetic field here, as tiny as it is, will subtract from the NMR magnetic field. So you don't see just one peak, you see two peaks. The boxed red proton will exist as two peaks because it has two different types of neighbors. And so the important point to remember is that NMR can never, it's not sensitive enough to look at one molecule. We're looking at populations of zillions of molecules at the same time. So let's just remember that these two protons <clears throat> will have different chemical shifts. because of that neighboring proton. Now, why wasn't this a pro problem with carbon NMR? We, we never had any splitting problem with carbon NMR. Let me go ahead and draw out a typical, um, uh, I guess, section of a large wax molecule for you. Just, this is just meant to be some run-of-the-mill organic molecule with lots of carbon atoms in the backbone. Doesn't matter if they're a ring or it doesn't matter if there's branching here. The point is that if I take a look at a typical carbon molecule, most of the carbons are carbon-12 that have no spin. Carbon-12, 
carbon-12. It's the carbon-12 isotope that's the one that's common. 99 out of 100 carbons are carbon-12. It's only one out of 100, and here it is, only one out of 100 carbons will be a carbon-13. And so the chances that this carbon-13 is going to be next to another carbon-13 is so small. There's almost no chance that, the, every, that if you grabbed a carbon-13 that it would have a neighbor that's also a carbon-13. So <clears throat> there's very little chance that you'll see. Um, uh, so I'll just write here, no 13C neighbor. On average, that's supposed to be an H there. On average, the typical C13 molecule will not have another carbon-13 neighbor. That just doesn't happen. So we never had to worry about this splitting effect with carbon-13 NMR spectroscopy. Um, that was never an issue for us. So what a wonderful situation for carbon NMR and that's why I started with carbon NMR. It makes the interpretation of, this, of the spectra very simple. Okay, so let's go back to this proton NMR business because it makes, uh, it will make our lives uh, substantially more complex. And we have to deal with that. Okay, so let's go ahead and talk about what happens if we have two different populations of molecules. What I want to do is I want to sketch out a, a tiny little spectrum up on top here. And then below that I'll draw these two possible situations uh, <clears throat> for a, a molecule where the proton has a neighbor. So I'm going to draw the same molecule twice. And so here I'll draw a molecule and we're really interested in this proton that's next to a chlorine atom just because it gives us something to focus on. And here it's got a neighboring carbon with a proton on it. And then right next door I'll draw the same molecule. And then after I've drawn these two molecules in an identical way, then we'll modify them so we can pay attention to the effects of, of differing spin of neighboring protons. Whoops, I didn't mean for those to be H's, I meant for those to be lines. There we go. There could be H's there. Okay, so I've got two protons. They're happy little neighbors. I would describe their relationship as vicinal. Remember we talked about vicinal dichlorides. They're, they're separated by three bonds if you walk between one or the other. And <clears throat> let me go ahead and, and note that if we were to try to focus on this proton right here, um, then we have to wonder whether the proton that's next door is spin up or spin down. And so I'm going to arbitrarily align these, these spins here. First of all, let me draw out our magnetic field. Here's our NMR magnet. That's this huge magnetic field created by our NMR machine, that superconducting uh, electromagnet. And now I've, uh, we're wondering what the chemical shift of this proton is going to be. Whatever that chemical shift is, if it was originally, the chlorine is going to deshield this proton. And so maybe the original chemical shift might be here. But when we take into account that this proton might have a, a chemical shift that's going um, either opposing or with the magnetic field, it's going to lead to two possible states. It's either going to subtract or add to the overall magnetic field and I think I've already drawn these backwards but don't worry about that. So in other words, I'll have two different, this, this proton here and let me circle it so I can be clear which proton we're looking at. This proton that I've circled now will end up with two different chemical shifts because it's affected by its neighbor. One of the peaks will be higher by a certain amount, by a certain frequency. The other peak will then be lower by a certain frequency from the original value. And we call this difference, this, this change, we call that splitting. And so you can see how you end up with this doublet splitting pattern because there are two and only two possibilities here. So again, the populations aren't exactly 50% because the NMR magnet tips this. It's like 50.001% and 49.9, but you'll never see that difference just by looking at those two peaks. So that's a classic doublet splitting pattern. And for all intents and purposes, the ratios of those two peaks is one to one. So that's what causes you to see doublets in your proton NMR spectrum. And on the relative scale of the NMR, the distance between those two little peaks looks tiny. Um, so I'm magnifying that here. I've really amplified up this spectrum. <clears throat> 
So a typical range of coupling constants um, and, and that's the distance in here. The distance between these two peaks, we call that the coupling constant and that coupling constant we use the symbol J to symbolize. It's typically equal to somewhere between 1 and 15 hertz and it is independent of the magnetic field. That coupling is caused by a proton, not by a, an NMR magnet machine. Because it's caused by a proton, that coupling, that, that difference in chemical shifts, it's totally invariant and independent of which type of NMR magnet you use. So we always characterize this splitting in hertz, not in parts per million. It's not created by the NMR magnet, it's created by a neighboring proton. So it's going to seem weird to you that we always list chemical shift in parts per million but we list these coupling distances in hertz um, but you just simply have to get used to that. And I'm not sure we're going to do so much with, with coupling constants uh, this quarter. Uh, that's kind of a, an advanced concept. Okay, so let's imagine a system that has two neighboring protons. I've explained how complex it can be with one neighboring proton. Um, let's talk about a system with two neighboring protons. And so once again I'm going to start off by drawing my, um, <clears throat> my NMR spectrum here and let's go ahead and redraw this two carbon system and here's the proton that we're going to, to, to discuss right here. I'll just draw it right there and now I'm going to have to draw three different scenarios for you. So I'm going to draw three of the same molecule over and over and over again. There we go. And this has neighbors. There's going to be neighboring protons. Not just one neighboring proton but two neighboring protons. And I'm struggling to squeeze those in here. And so here's my other neighboring molecule. It's got a neighboring proton number one and neighboring proton number two. And then over here on my third molecule I've got neighboring proton number one and neighboring proton number two. And I'll show you why there's a fourth possibility that we're going to have to consider. So let's, once again, let's imagine that we're in this huge magnetic field created by the NMR magnet. I think physicists use some sort of symbol like B naught or something for, um, to represent the strength of the magnetic field and I'm not that sophisticated. Okay, so here's our, uh, <clears throat> so here's our, uh, the proton, let me circle the proton that we're looking at. So we're really interested in what's the chemical shift of this? It's going to be affected by its neighbors. And let's take a look at the possibilities as we look at the various molecules in our collection of zillions of molecules spinning and tumbling around. What are those possibilities? So one possibility is that, is that both of these protons um, have, have chemical shifts or sorry, have spins that both align opposite the NMR magnetic field. And so they're both subtracting in the same way. The other possibility is I have a, a proton that has spin up and the other proton has spin down. And so in effect they'll cancel each other out. It's like that proton doesn't even have any neighboring protons because these two neighboring spins can cancel each other out. And there's two different ways you can end up with that scenario. So right below this molecule, I'm going to redraw that same situation. Two carbons and it has a neighbor with two protons attached. There's two different ways to have that scenario. And we're focusing in here on this, this proton that I've circled because I don't want to get all confused and look at the protons that have arrows on them. And so now when I look at these possibilities, there's another way that these two protons, instead of having the top proton with spin up, maybe the top proton could have spin down. And then if this neighboring one on the side here has spin up, that's another way that they could cancel out. So there's two equally probable ways in which the neighboring protons can cancel each other out with their spins, with their quantized spins that can only be up or down. And then the last possibility is that both of these protons will have, um, instead of both protons with spin down, will, will have uh, spin up. <clears throat> and so now adding to, to the magnetic field of the magnet. So three possibilities and they're not equal. The middle possibility where the two protons cancel each other out is twice as likely as the two scenarios on the end. So what I'll end up with is three peaks in my NMR spectrum. And those three peaks will now look like this. 
So, so the circled pink proton here, instead of looking like one peak, will look like, um, let me just draw a little, a, a little midline here to, w so I could see what that pink proton would look like if there was no neighboring proton. So one possibility is that these two protons are subtracting. One possibility is that these two protons are significantly adding. And then the middle possibility is that they're canceling each other out. And the ratios of those peaks will be one to two to one. And maybe I didn't do a good job of drawing them where they look like they have that peak area. So that's a classical triplet. And I know it's a triplet because the ratio of peak areas is one to two to one. And it's caused by these neighboring protons. And we characterize this splitting, the, the magnitude of this splitting um, with, once again, with this, with this uh, variable J or coupling constant. And so if you wanted to measure the coupling constant there, the effect of this neighboring proton, you'd measure either from the outer peak to the big inner peak or from the big inner peak to the, the far outer peak there. And again, that's going to be some coupling constant J that's measured in Hertz. Okay, you can have more neighbors than two neighboring protons, right? You can have lots of neighboring protons. So you can imagine how this complexity can build up very rapidly. To take one simple signal, this one pink proton can be split into seven, eight peaks, no problem. Uh, you, you'll find lots of spectra where a single proton gets split into, into many peaks. Yes? What does J tell you and how can you use that? Um, I'm peering ahead here to, <laughs> I can't remember whether I talk, it tells you a lot actually. Well, I'll, I'll just tell you. It tells you one of two things. If you're coupled to a proton on the same, so the question is what does J tell you? So if you're coupled, and we're not going to go into this detail. You don't need to, to worry about using this information. J is, the, the magnitude of J depends on two things. If you're two protons coupled on the same carbon atom, you're coupled to each other, you're feeling each other's magnetic field, the angle between these two, two protons controls J. So if you're clever, you can use J to learn something about the angle between these two, two protons. If you're on two protons that are on neighboring carbons and you're affecting each other's magnetic field, it's the torsion angle between those two protons, like this. You get maximum coupling when the two protons are antiperiplanar or synperiplanar. You get zero coupling if they're orthogonal in 90 degree torsion angles. So uh, if you take an advanced class in spectroscopy, you'll use that coupling constant information to learn about torsion angle and the shape of your molecule. And you won't do that in this class, too advanced. It's so hard just to get a grasp on simple coupling patterns uh, that you won't be able to, well I say that, maybe you will. It would be awesome if you guys <coughs> could start taking that stuff into account. Okay, so let's go ahead and talk about um, various common arrangements of protons. When do you expect, when are protons close enough to affect each other. So here's, I'll, I'll give you three coupling scenarios. So one common coupling scenario is two protons on the same carbon. And these couplings are typically around 15 hertz, but as I just told you, it depends on the angle between those two protons. So in other words, that's, to me, that looks like a big coupling. It's a coupling where you can see right through those peaks on the NMR spectrum. Sometimes the peak, the little peaks are so close, you can't even tell that there's two peaks there. It's hard to tell. Okay, that's one coupling scenario where they're close enough to couple. The second coupling scenario is where they're on neighboring carbons. We would call that vicinal coupling. And if I count how many bonds between these two protons, there's one, two, three bonds. So that's a three bond coupling. And this varies hugely depending on the torsion angle. So three to 12 hertz, right? So in other words, at best, it's almost as big as a geminal coupling, a two bond coupling. But at worst, it's almost zero. So it can be very small and hard to see that coupling. So I typically would call this a two bond coupling or a geminal coupling. And I would typically call this a three bond coupling. So if you hear me refer to that. There's a third type of coupling. And it's rare and it's small. And I, um, I don't think I would ask you or expect you to know this one, but <clears throat> but you might see it in some NMR spectra and wonder why is that there. So when you have 
protons separated not by three bonds but by four bonds. In this arrangement where it has the shape of a W, sometimes, some people call this W coupling, you can sometimes see a small coupling and it's small. It's not like 15 hertz, I meant to draw this in black, it's not like 15 hertz, it's not like 12 hertz, it's usually less than two. So when you got this, this sort of W shape, those two protons can couple to each other. <clears throat> Five bonds, no, you don't worry about that. And so let me just say that this four bond coupling is rare, but you might see it. I, I don't think I would purposely give you a spectrum that had four bond coupling in it. Um, I feel like I might have seen that in some of the lab spectra, but I, I, I'm not sure. So mainly, you just worrying about two bond and three bond couplings, you're going to find that proton NMR is this, is this difficult to use spectroscopy at first. It will take time for you to acclimate to that. Okay, so we measure coupling constant, uh, we, we assign it the variable J and it's not like you do any math with that, but if I say J value, you'll know I'm talking about a coupling constant. And you can have different magnitudes, sometimes easy to see two peaks, sometimes there's the coupling constant is so small it almost looks like one peak. Okay, so when will you see coupling and when will you not see coupling? Here's some key rules to remind you of. Equivalent protons don't split each other. Wow. And we don't need to go into to the profound nature of that. The point is equivalent protons don't split. So here's an example of a situation where where magnetically equivalent protons, protons that have exactly the same chemical shift don't split each other. So if I look at this molecule, these two protons are identical as far as the NMR is concerned. They'll exist as one peak and they don't split each other. You don't see any splitting by those two protons even though they are on neighboring carbons. So no splitting here. Uh, actually that's not the most common case where you see no splitting. The most common case where you see no splitting is a methyl group. In every case, the protons on a methyl group are equivalent. So these always show as a 3H singlet whenever you have a methyl group. So that, 3H, and watch this, I'm going to write the letter S there to mean singlet. They don't split. They're equivalent. So whenever you see a 3H singlet, usually a towering peak in your NMR, um, that's usually, I can't think of any case where that's not a methyl group, but maybe I could design one in theory. It, um, okay, so here's a case. <clears throat> These two protons here. Those two protons are enantiotopic. There's no difference between those in a, in a proton NMR spectrum. They don't split each other. So let me just go ahead and write that here. These two protons don't split. These two protons here, they don't split. <clears throat> And these two protons here, or actually this group of protons here, they don't split each other. But what I want to do is talk about this proton over here, the OH. Hydrogen bonded protons don't spend all their time attached to one atom very well. They kind of hydrogen bond to this group over here and then they're attached to me and then they hydrogen bond and then they're attached to me. On the time scale of the NMR experiment, after you pulse with energy, that proton is moving back and forth hydrogen bonding with lots of other stuff in solution before I finally give my energy back. And as a result, what you find is that H bonded protons almost never split their neighbors. And I say almost never. In no case in this class would I give you a, a spectrum because it would be weird where the OH, which is capable of hydrogen bonding, uh, would split the neighboring protons. So it, the, the NMR spectrum for, for this would have these two appear because they're identical. They don't split each other. These would exist as one peak, a singlet, at 4.5 parts per million. In other words, they're not being split by the OH. That's because OHs will be hydrogen bonding with other molecules just like itself in solution. And this OH over here would exist as one peak, not split by the, the two H's nearby at 3.2 parts per million. So you have to look out for, for H's attached to heteroatoms because those are good at hydrogen bonding. Yes, question? Could you say that a little louder, please? Yeah. 
why these split? Oh, oh, that's only, yeah, I didn't draw the rest of the molecule. The rest of the molecule has to have stereogenic centers. I'm, if these are chemically inequivalent, it depends on what's attached here. If I, if as I showed you here, it's a bromine and a chlorine, well then they won't split each other, like I just told you. So it depends on what else is attached here. So maybe you'd like an example of a, of a geminal compound that would have, here's an example of a geminal pair of protons that would split each other. Here's a ring, here's a chlorine on the bottom, and a T-butyl group equatorial. These two H's are now non-equivalent. One H is on the same face as the chlorine, the other H is on the same face as the T-butyl group. And those two H's are now chemically different and they will split each other. So I, I didn't draw the rest of this molecule. It depends on what's attached. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> okay, so yeah, let's, so let's go ahead and keep talking about this splitting thing. Yes? Say again. Um, so we talked about this issue of enantiotopic and diastereotopic protons. Enantiotopic protons are magnetically equivalent. They're, they give identical chemical shifts by NMR. Um, the NMR experiment cannot distinguish between enantiotopic protons. So because these two protons are enantiotopic, um, they occur with exactly the same chemical shift and so they don't affect each other. And I, I, I mean, I'm not, we can't go into the origin of that effect right here. <laughs> we need to move on for the, um, and they just don't split each other. The equivalent protons do not split each other if they have exactly the same chemical shift. And thank you for asking those questions because everybody is, even if I'm not ready to go into the details behind that, that means everybody else is wondering the same thing. This, this tiny little effect that I saved for last, right? We've covered 90% of NMR, but this tiny little effect of splitting is what makes proton NMR so challenging um, <clears throat> and will create most of the work for you in terms of interpretation. Okay, so Let's talk about this simple n plus one splitting rule. We don't, you don't need to draw out these diagrams with proton neighbors spin up and proton neighbors spin down. It's far simpler to analyze splitting patterns just by using an empirical rule called the n plus one splitting rule. So if, uh, this, the rule is very simple. It says n equivalent neighboring protons give n plus one peaks. So n equivalent neighboring, so here's an example where I'm drawing a three carbon system and I'm not drawing what the neighboring, uh, what the neighboring groups are. What I'm simply doing is I'm simply telling you that there are no protons here, no protons here, no protons here, and no protons there. In this situation where there are no neighboring protons, two bonds, three bonds, or four bonds away, this would appear as a, sing as a singlet. So the number of neighbors here, let's just write number of neighbors that are two, three, or four bonds away here is zero. So according to the n plus one rule, zero plus one, that should appear as a, a single peak, a singlet. So let me sketch that out. Zero neighbors, n plus one, it'll appear as one peak. And we call that a singlet. But now let's, let's take a look at an alternative scenario where there's a single neighboring proton. And who cares what the other groups are? Chlorines, bromines, maybe it's part of a double bond, carbon atoms. I'm not going to draw any, th any of the other neighboring atoms. We don't care about those. I'm simply telling you that in this scenario, um, there's one neighboring proton that's either two, three, or four bonds uh, away like this. And so the n plus one rule says one plus one, n plus one, if there's n neighbors, one neighbor, then I ought to see this appear, this, this proton appear as a doublet two peaks. And I didn't do a good job because it would, you know, the area would be half of each peak, but they would add up to as much area as one tall peak here. So <clears throat> I wish I had drawn those sh that shorter. And of course we would call this a doublet. That's our sort of nomenclature here. So now we're, we're going to take the scenario, 
where we have this proton, we're looking at this proton here and now it's got two neighboring protons that are either two, two bonds away, three bonds away. And so now with those, <clears throat> with those two neighboring protons, the n plus one rule says two plus one, it ought to appear as a triplet. And I don't need to draw any fancy diagrams. I just need to look at how, count up the neighbors and say, oh, triplet. And remember the peak ratios I told you for a triplet. It's one to two to one. And if I didn't draw that, that peak area ratio correctly, then I'm not drawing a, a correct triplet. And, and you could go on inventing scenarios where you had three neighbors, et, et cetera. Okay, so <clears throat> you don't need, so the n plus one rule predicts whether you'll get a singlet, doublet, or triplet. Um, importantly, the peak areas are predicted by s something called Pascal's triangle, which I think you get s from some sort of binomial expansion mathematics. Um, Pascal's triangle, you could recreate that simply by adding one plus one equals, uh, one plus one equals two, and one plus two equals three, and one plus three equals four. Uh, you know, there's some simple addition you can do between each neighboring pair of numbers that gives you the next row of numbers. So what this does, what Pascal's triangle does is it predicts for you the peak intensities for all the common splitting patterns. <clears throat> yes? Say again? For this scenario? Yeah, I didn't draw. So let me just invent a scenario where it has nothing else there so that you're not, so it seems weird that I didn't take the time to draw anything here. I, I was just didn't want to, here's what I didn't want to do. If I draw extra stuff here, it becomes so complex, right? Here's two chlorines, here's a bromine, here's another, right? I, I just didn't want it to look too busy. So the intent was that there weren't any other protons there and I was afraid to draw extra atoms because I thought it would look too complex. So you just have to imagine a scenario where there were no extra protons as neighbors. Oh, okay, um, okay, so let's go ahead and talk about these peak uh, area intensities. For a singlet, you don't need to worry about whether it's one to two to one ratio. A singlet um, exists as a single peak. And, and I'll, I'm not going to write the word singlet anywhere on any spectrum. I'm simply going to write S and it, that's meant to understand that that, that uh, peak is a singlet and not two peaks that are close to each other. When you see two peaks with a, tiny peaks in a one to one ratio, that could be a doublet and I'll symbolize that with the, with the letter D. And the two peaks will of course be in a, close to a one to one ratio. And if you see three peaks, if it really is a triplet, we would symbolize that with the letter T and those peaks for the statistical reasons I showed you should appear in a one to two to one ratio. And then finally, if, well not finally, a quartet. So you see how the language works. We symbolize with the letter Q. Those will exist, the peaks will appear in a one to three to three to one ratio. If they are not approximately one to three to three to one, then I would worry that maybe that's not a regular, and you can keep going all the way down to a, a septet or with seven peaks or, 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 or more. So finally, you'll get to some scenarios where there's so much splitting and so much coupling going on that you simply can't interpret it. And that's very common. And quite often, we simply just throw up our hands and say, that's a multiplet. I, I don't know how many peaks are in there. I can't even see between the peaks. There's, they're so crowded. And we symbolize that with an M. And that means I've given up trying to assign how many peaks are actually in that, that little forest of, of peaks there. Yes? Because in this scenario, this is all due to a single proton. So the area under here has to equal the signal given off by a single proton. And so here, this is given off by a single proton. So in other words, a singlet might have an intensity that looks like this, um, but a quartet, even though the area adds up to the same, will look smaller, but if you add up the area, it would be exactly identical because it would arise from a single proton in the spectrum. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at a real spectrum that is splitting. And I think this came right out of the, the Gorzinski Smith textbook. It's dichloroethane. <clears throat> and this is quite common. So if I look at the spectrum in the blue background here, 
at this peak that's located around 5.9 parts per million. Uh, it's kind of hard to tell what's going on there. The peaks are so scrunched together. So quite often, if somebody doesn't tell you how many peaks are there, they might give you an expansion. So see how they've expanded it here so you can now see. Ah, I see four peaks. And look how satisfying that is. They're present in a one to three to three to one ratio. That's a quartet. That's not just four peaks that happen to be close together. Uh, I'd bet money that that's a quart. Oh, I know it's a quartet here. And then here's this other. Uh, and then here's this other peak where you can't quite tell by looking at the blue, uh, tiny spectrum. Is that one peak or two peaks close together? But when they give you the expansion, you can see daylight between those two peaks. That's definitely um, two peaks and not one peak. So two peaks that are close together, and. Those two peaks are a, a, a doublet, pretty clearly. The, you know, the peaks aren't exactly the same height, um, but it's pretty close to one to one. So you see these, these peak ratios for quartet one to three to three to one, um, and for a doublet one to one ratios. So what's going on here? So the proton that's appearing farthest downfield at 5.9 parts per million, is it the red protons or is it the green protons that are appearing here at 5.9? It's the green proton that's closest to the, elect these, these electronated chlorine atoms are de-shielding that proton, sort of sucking electron density from around it. So that's the proton here that's, that's appearing at 5.9 parts per million. And so why is it appearing as a quartet? The reason that's appearing as a quartet is because, um, is because red protons are splitting that. And there's three of these red protons. And according to the n plus one rule, so let's look at the n plus one rule. Three plus one equals quartet. We could have predicted that. This green proton is the farthest down field and it's being split into a quartet and you could have predicted what this spectrum would look like ahead of time. Okay, let's come over and look at the CH3 group. If I look at the integration, there's this lame integration line here. If I took out a ruler and I'd measure, um, that would correspond to some sort of area under the integration line and what, however far up I go with my integration line, it's, it's three times higher than I went up with this first one. So that corresponds to the fact that the area under these two peaks is three times bigger than the area under these four peaks. And that, that methyl group is not shifted as far downfield. This carbon is now one carbon further away from those two chlorine atoms. Uh, so those protons aren't de-shielded anywhere near as much. And why is that split into two peaks as a doublet? It's split into two peaks as a doublet because this little proton over here, that's one proton, n plus one rule says one plus one equals two or doublet. So again, the n plus one rule predicts for you this sort of splitting pattern, singlet, doublet, triplet, when you look at an NMR spectrum. Okay, let's take a look at another example that has splitting. And again, this is, I think this is a figure that came out of the book. I can't remember where I got this. Okay, so now we have a, a compound that's highly symmetrical. And the reason I'm showing you this is I wanted to point out that the, the protons that are the, the protons that are splitting don't have to be attached to the same carbon. So these two protons that are next to, that are on carbon next to bromine, there's four of them. And they're indistinguishable and identical. The protons on the, the left hand side of the molecule that are on carbon attached to bromine are indistinguishable from the carbons uh, on the right hand side of the molecule that are attached to bromine. So all four of these protons I expect to appear as a single signal. Maybe not one peak, but they'll all have the same intrinsic chemical shift before you split them. And so uh, since those are closer to bromine than the, the protons in the middle of the molecule, I expect these four protons to be shifted farthest downfield. And here they are at about three and a half parts per million. And very nicely there's an inset for you that allows you to see um, those four protons. So here's my signal. It's 4H. It's a 4H signal. There's four protons in there. These are protons B. And they're being affected by their neighbor, the CH2 group. 
there's two protons there, the n plus one rule tells us that these will, will split, these protons here will split this 4H signal into two plus one equals triplet. It's amazing, even though these, these four protons aren't all attached to the same carbon, they still are affected by this neighbor in the same way following the n plus one rule. So the, I would call that a 4H triplet. That's the way you would abbreviate that in an NMR spectrum. 4H comma italics T. We use italics for singlet, doublet, triplet. So now let's walk over here to, this, to the CH2 group that's in the middle of the molecule and think about that. And, and you can see that signal down here at 2.3 parts per million. So when we think about what kind of splitting pattern we expect to see, if we look over here, there's a set of peaks at the expansion. One, two, three, four, five. Five peaks, it's a pentet. And so <clears throat> what's happening here is that these four neighboring protons, whoops, maybe I should use it. Well, I've already started to use the black pen here. These four neighboring protons split this into four plus one equals pentet. And if I think about the integration there, it should be a 2H comma pentet. That's very unusual actually to see a pentet, um, but it would be italics P. So oftentimes people won't, I won't show you the inset. I'll simply write 2H comma P. 2H means you don't have to look at the integration line. You know how many protons are there. And italics P means you don't have to count up the peaks. Um, to know that that's an actual pentet. Okay, let's go ahead and talk about uh, some very, oh, I, it looks like I was ready to talk about some variations in, in the magnitude of coupling and splitting. Okay, so the coupling, as I already mentioned, the, the coupling constant de depends on angles. So the actual angle here between two geminal protons will cause the coupling constant not to be 15 hertz, that's kind of an average number, but to vary between 12 to 18 hertz. Um, so 18 hertz is a pretty big coupling. But there's an exception to that. Well, maybe not an exception, but if you really stretch this angle out to 120 degrees, so that's what you, that's the angles that you have for substituents on an sp2 hybridized carbon, 120 degrees. It's 109 for a sp3 hybridized carbon, but when you really expand that angle out, the coupling starts to get very small. So you can see here for the two H's at the end uh, of a, a CC double bond, sometimes it's very hard to see any coupling at all. So the angle matters a lot. So be careful before you, you say that, uh, before you, claim that there's no coupling there because it, it might simply be the CH2 at, at, at the end of a CC double bond. Um, so for vicinal protons, the maximum coupling you'll ever see is when two protons are anti periplanar to each other and that can be up to 18 hertz in value. When the two protons are, are syn, they'll be a little bit smaller. A very typical coupling constant like the ones you saw in that last spectrum, the, the, the sort of distance between peaks, um, has to do with rotatable bonds. So a, a most typical range for coupling constants that you would see when you see splitting patterns between those tiny, uh, tiny splitting patterns between peaks is about five to seven hertz. Seven hertz is probably the most common average coupling constant you'll ever see for rotatable bonds. Now I, I don't believe I'm going to show you any spectra that involve, um, that involve you analyzing those different coupling patterns. Um, so don't worry about that. Okay, sounds like everybody's picking up to go. That means we haven't finished the, the proton NMR and I'll try to finish up the last bit on Wednesday. Um, but try to do is, you should be able to do almost all of the problems in, in the sapling homework based on the stuff that you've got right now. <laughs>